Welcome to Heavy D Story Time. How are you doing today? We are going to be reading. Yes, reading. Mm -hmm. We're going to be reading the Bible. Hi. Then we are going to be doing the synopsis. Hi. I fell asleep last video, so. So we're gonna, gonna have to listen pay, to that. We're gonna do extra attention to the synopsis because I think JJ and I both fell asleep <laughs> during the last video. And then we are going to be doing dragon drums with my mommy. Yay. So, Hi, thanks cool. for joining us. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. Alright, so we are going to start this evening. Oh, tell them what to do. And you guys are going to be hitting the like button, like button, subscribing, and hitting the bell. Alright. So now we're going to read Psalms. We are in uh, Psalm 6. <clears throat> this is the English Standard Version of the Bible, and I will be reading Psalm 6. To the choir master with stringed instruments according to the Sheminith. Whatever that is. I'm not, I really don't know what it is. I apologize. Homework. <laughs> yeah, homework. It says, it, there's actually a footnote, it says probably a musical term, also 12 verse 1. Alright, so when we get to 12 verse 1, I'll see what I can look up between now and then. Alright. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. My moaning, excuse me. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and, gr and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Psalm 7, a Shigeon of David. Once again, another term that is very interesting and yet not familiar, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjaminite. O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. O oh, Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust, Salah. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O oh, righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is my righteous judge. Sorry, it says God is a righteous judge. And a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, 
and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to the righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. So his own skull, his violence descends, reminded me of that story in the book of Judges with uh, regarding the tent stick. And I don't remember the guy's name, but I wouldn't have wanted to have been him. All right. So we will read one more uh, just so we end on a positive note. This is Psalm 8, which is pretty uh, well known. Uh, to the choir master, according to the Gittith. Good night. Um, how many Hebrew terms can they throw in here? That you don't know. Once again, it says probably a musical term um, and names two other psalms where it's mentioned. A psalm of David, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That is where we will end today, and tomorrow we will pick up with Psalm 9. And I hope you're enjoying the reading of God's Word. At this time, I will pass it off to Kimberly to give us the synopsis. So, in the last few chapters, we, um, we read about... Um, Dash it all, I forgot his name again. Give me a moment. Yes, Primer. I know it starts in the P. <laughs> I'm getting there, and I did remember it yesterday. But anyway. I know, JJ. So, what happened was, Primer, he came home from the Gather. That's what it's called, the Gather. He came home from the Gather, and the... The hatching, which in the hatching it turns out that um, you see in the hatchings it's like a bunch of people who are like candidates, except a person who wasn't a candidate um, got a dragon, and I forget her name. I'm sorry again. Um, but she was in the uh, Miram. Miram. She was in one of the other books, and we got to know her, and she was a friend of Melanie's. Minnelli's, and um, and then after he got home, um, he went into his room, and it smelled horrible, and I think that... It was his room and his roommate's room. Yeah, his roommate's too, and I'll explain. I think they peed on his clothes. They peed on his bedding, and, and they pooped on all of his clothes. I don't know if they did it or if they put poop, I don't know. It's weird. But it's a prank... Yeah. A really bad prank. Only they thought he was coming home right away. And they had to sleep with it. For two nights. <laughs> and then, like, they came over and they're like, Hey, where have you been? You should have been here two days ago. And they were all mad. And he didn't know why exactly. And then he figured it out once, um, once he got into his room. Chrissy, go. So, then after that, um... It goes on about how they try to make his life all horrible and how he's learning the drum measures a bit better. And while he's washing his clothes, um, he talks to somebody about um, part of what's been happening. So somebody else, um, I don't exactly know how much he told her. Like, 
But he does trust her, and I'm fairly certain that she's not with the other roommate people. She's like the head, the head housekeeper. Yeah, she's the she head housekeeper. She runs the Harper Hall. Yeah. In the women's side of the Harper Hall. The housekeeping side of the Yeah. House. Yeah. Um, yeah. And is that about it? Um, yeah. I think they want to go O-U-T-S-I-D-E. Want to go do that real quick? Okay. Okay. I'll call, but I need you to hurry. So. It's okay, you can start. Um, well, it's okay. Chapter four was um, 33 pages. That's why we took two days to do chapter four. Chapter five is 10 pages, and we're getting started a little bit late because we were watching our favorite show, Doctor Who. And it was a Christmas episode, and we didn't realize or remember that it went longer than normal. So we are a little late tonight, so I will read chapter five. And then chapter six is 23 pages. So we'll probably break that up over two nights, too, just because that's a lot to read in one night. And this print is small. <clears throat> okay, so Kimmy, let me know when you get back in. Okay, listen. I'm waiting on the staircase till they need to come back in. Thanks. Chapter 5. That afternoon, a drum message came in from the north. Pimer was in the main room diligently copying drum measures that Durzen had set him to learn by evening, although he already knew them off rhythm perfect. He translated the message as it throbbed in. Urgent. Reply required, please. Nabol. To himself, Pimer smiled as the rest of the message pounded on because... He had the sudden suspicion that the Nebel drummer had begun with those measures to soften the arrogance of the main message. Lord, Lord Mirren of Nebel demands the immediate appearance of Master Oldive. Re reply instantly. Had the drummer added grave illness, the signal urgent would have been appropriate. Pimer continued his copying smoothly, aware of the eyes of the other apprentices on him. Let them think that he understood little beyond the first three measures, which was about all they'd know. Rokoyas, the journeyman on duty, came into the room a moment later. Who's running messages today, he asked, the thin folded sheaf of the transcripted message in his hand. The others all pointed to Pimer, who immediately put his pen down and rose to his feet. The journeyman frowned. You were on yesterday. I'm on today again, Rokoyas, said Pimer cheerfully and reached for the sheaf. Seems to me you're always on, Rakaya said, holding the message away from Pimer as he glared suspiciously at the others. Durzen said I was the messenger until he said otherwise, said Pimer, shrugging as if it were a matter of indifference to him. All right, then, and the journeyman surrendered the message, still eyeing the other four boys, but it seems queer to me you're always running. I'm newest, said Pimer, and left the room. He had rather pleased, or he was rather pleased, that Roy Roykus had noticed. Actually, he didn't mind because he got a brief respite from the sour presence of the other apprentices. He dashed down the three flights of steps in his usual fashion, one hand lightly on the stone rail, plummeting down as fast as he could go. He burst out into the courtyard, automatically glancing about. The raked, the raked team was at work. Raking team, sorry. It's a little distracting here. <laughs> He waved cheerfully to the section leader and then took the main steps to the hall three at a time. His legs must be getting longer, he thought, or he was improving his stride because he used to be able to leap only two. Slightly puffed, he tapped politely at Master Oldive's door and handed over the message, wheeling instantly so that no one could say he'd seen the message. Hold on a moment, young Pimer, said Master Oldive, unfolding the sheaf and frowning as he read its contents. Urgent, is it? Well, it could be at that. Though, why they wouldn't in courtesy send their watch dragon? Ah, well. Nabol hasn't one, has he? Reply, reply that I'll come, and please ask Master Oldkey to pass the word to Taliden that I must prevail on his good nature for passage to Nabol. I shall be, go straight to the meadow to await for him. Pimer repeated the message using Master Aldive's exact phrasing and information, intonation. 
Released by the healer, he sped back across the court with another wave to the section leader. He was halfway up the second flight when he felt his right foot slide on the stone. He tried to catch himself, but his forward mo motion and the stretch of his legs were such that he hadn't a hope of saving himself from a fall. He tried to grab the stone railing with his right hand, but it too was slick. He was thrown hard against the stone risers, wrenching thighs and hips, cracking his ribs painfully as he slid. He could have sworn that he heard a muffled laugh. His last conscious thought of his, as his chin hit the stone and he bit his tongue hard was that someone had greased the rail and steps. His shoulder was roughly shaken and he heard Durzen's irritated command to wake up. What are you doing here? Why didn't you return immediately with Master Aldev's request? He's been waiting in the meadow. You can't even be trusted to run messages? Pimer tried to form an excuse, but only a groan issued from his lips as he groggily turned or tried to right himself. He was dimly conscious of aches and pains all over his left side and sore stiffness across his cheek and up under his chin. Fell on the steps, did you? Knocked yourself out, huh? Durzen was unsympathetic, but he was less rough-handed as he helped Pimer turn and sit on the bottom step. Greased, Pimer mumbled, waving with one hand as the steps, at the steps while with the other he cushioned his aching head to reduce the pounding in his skull. But every place he touched his head seemed to ache too, and the agony was making him ill to his stomach. Greased? Greased! Durzen exclaimed in acid disbelief. I like a likely notion. You're always pelting up and down these steps. It's a wonder you haven't hurt yourself before now. Can you get up? Pimer started to shake his head, but the slightest motion made him feel sick to his stomach. If he had to spew in front of Durzen, he'd be doubly humili humiliated. And if he tried to move, he knew he would be ill. You said it was greased? Durzen's voice came from above his head. The agitated tone hurt Pimer's skull. Step there and handrail. Pimer gestured with one hand. There's not a sign of grease on your feet. Durzen sounded angrier than ever. Did you find him, Durzen? Rokoyas called. The voice of the duty journeyman made Pimer's head throb like a message drum. What happened to him? He fell down the steps and knocked himself between. Durzen was thoroughly disgusted. Get up, Pimer. No, Pimer, stay where you are, said Rokoyas, and his voice was unexpectedly concerned. Pimer wished he wouldn't shout, but he was very willing to stay where he was. The nausea in his belly seemed to be echoed by his head, and he didn't dare so much as open his eyes. Things whirled even with them shut. He said it was greased. Feel it yourself, Rokoyas, clean as a drum. Too clean, and if Pimer fell on his way back, he was between a long time. Too long for a mere slip. We'd better get him to Sylvina. To Sylvina? Why bother her for a little tumble? He's only skinned his chin. Rokoya's hands were gently pressed against his skull and neck, then his arms and legs. He couldn't suppress a yelp when a particularly painful bruise was touched. This wasn't a little tumble, Durzen. I know you don't like the boy, but any fool could see he's hurt. Can you stand, Pimer? Pimer groaned, which was all he dared to do at, or his dinner would come up. He's faking to get out of duty, Durzen said. He's not faking, Durzen, and another thing, he's done too much of the running. Clell and the others haven't moved their butts out of the drum heights the last two seven days I've been on duty. Pimer's the newest, you know the rule. Oh, leave off, Durzen, and take him from the other side. I want to carry him as flat as possible. With Durzen's grudging assistance, they carried him down the stairs. Pimer, fighting against his nausea, was only dazedly aware that Brokoyas shouted for someone to fetch Sylvina and be quick. They were maneuvering him up the steps to the main hall towards the infirmary when Sylvina intercepted them, asking quick questions to which she got simultaneous answers from Durzen and Rikoyas. He fell down the stairs, said Rikoyas. Nothing but a tumble, said Durzen, overriding the other man, kept Master Oldive standing in the meadow. Sylvina's hands felt cool on his face, moved gently over his skull. He knocked himself between Sylvina, probably for a good twenty minutes or more, Rikoyas was saying his urgent tone cutting through Durzen's petulant complaints. He claimed there was grease. There was grease, said Sylvina. Look at his high shoe, Durzen. Pimer, do you feel nauseated? Pimer made an affirmative sound, hoping that he could suppress the urge to spew until he was in the infirmary, even as a small spark of irreverence suggested that here was a superb opportunity to get back at Durzen with no possible repercussions. He's jarred his skull all right. Smart of you to carry him prone, Rikoyas. 
here now, set down, set him down on this bed. No, you fool, don't sit him. The tipping of his body upward triggered the nausea and Pimer spewed violently onto the floor. Miserable at such a lack of control, Pimer was also powerless to prevent the heaving that shook him. Then he felt Savina's hand supporting his head, was aware that a basin was appro appropriately in position. Savina spoke in a soothing tone, half supporting his trembling body as he continued to vomit. He was thoroughly exhausted and trembling when the spasms ended and he had, was eased back against a pile of pillows and could rest his aching head. I take it that Master Oldive has already gone off to Nabal? How did you know where he went? demanded Durzin, irritably astonished. You are a proper idiot, Durzin. I haven't lived in the Harper Hall all my life without being able to understand drum messages quite well. Not to worry, she said, and now her fingertips were del delicately measuring Pimer's skull inch by inch. I can't feel a crack or split. He may have done no more than rattle his brains. Rest quiet, and time will cure that thumping. Yes, Master Robinson? Sylvina's hands paused as she tucked the sleeping fur about Pimer's chin. Pimer's been hurt, the harper's voice was anxious. As Pimer turned to one elbow to acknowledge the harper's, the harper's entrance, Sylvina's hands forced him back against the pile of pillows. Not seriously, I'm relieved to say, but let's all leave the room. I'd like a word with these journeymen in your presence, Master Robin. The door closed and Pimer fought between the overwhelming desire to sleep and curiosity about what she had to say to Durzin and Rokoyas in front of the Master Harper. Sleep conquered. Once she'd closed the door, Sylvina gave vent to the anger she'd held in since she'd first glimpsed the gray pallor of Pimer's, Pimer's face and heard Durzin's nasal complaints. How could you let matters get so out of hand, Durzin? She demanded, whirling on the astonished journeyman. What sort of prank is that for apprentices to try to on anyone? Pimer's not been himself, but I put that down to losing his voice and adjusting to the disappointment over the music. But this, this is criminal. Sylvina brandished Pimer's begreased boot at Durzin, backing the astonished journeyman against the wall, oblivious to Master Robinson's repeated query about Pimer's condition. To Menelie's precipitous arrival, her face flushed and furrowed with anxiety, and to Rakoya's delighted and amused observation. Enough, Sylvina, the Master Harper's voice was loud enough to quell her momentarily, but she turned to him with an injunction to keep his voice down. Please. I will said the harper in a moderate tone keeping Sylvina turned towards him and away from the subject of her ire if you will tell me what happened to Pimer Sylvina let out an exasperated breath glared once more at Durzin and then answered Master Robinson his skull isn't cracked though how it wasn't I'll never know she exhibited the glistening sole of Pimer's boot with stair treads coated with grease he's bruised scraped and shaken and he's definitely suffering from shock and concussion when will he recover? There was an urgency behind the harper's voice that Sylvina heard. Now she gave him a long, keen look. She's like the mom, basically. A few uh -huh. days rest will see him right, I'm sure, but I mean rest. She crossed her hands in a wiping motion to emphasize her verdict, then pointed to the closed infirmary door. Right here, nowhere near those murdering louts in the drum heights. Murdering? Durzin gasped an objection to her term. He could have been killed. You know how Pimer climbs steps, she said, scowling fiercely at the journeyman. But, but there wasn't a trace of grease on those steps on the ra or the railing. I tested them all myself. Too clean, said Rakoyas, and earned a rep reprimanding glare from Durzin. Too clean. Rakoyas repeated and then said to Sylvina, Pimer's decidedly odd man. He learns too quickly and spouts off what he hears. Durzin spoke sharply, determined that Pimer should share the responsibility for this untoward incident. Not Pimer, Sylvina and Menely said in one breath. Durzin sputtered a moment. But there have been several very private messages that were all over the hall, and everyone knows how much Pimer talks. What a conniver he is. Conniver, yes, said Sylvina, just as Menely drew breath to defend her friend. Blabberer, no. He's not been saying more than please and thank you lately either, I'd noticed. And I've noticed some other things happening to him that ought to, not to have. Now, no mere pranks for the new lad in the craft, either. Durzin moved uneasily under her intense stare and looked appealingly towards the Master Harper. How much of drum message has Pimer learned in his time with you? Asked the Harper, no expression in voice or face other than polite inquiry. Well, now, he does seem to have picked up every measure I've set him, in fact, and Durzin admitted this reluctantly. 
He has quite a knack for it, though. Of course, he's not done more than beat the words or listen with the journeyman on duty. He glanced at Roykas for support. I'd say Pimer knows more than he admits, said Roykas in a droll tone, grinning when Durzen began to mouth a denial. I'd... It'd be like Pimer, said Menelie with a grin, and then, touching Sylvina's arm, does he need someone with him right now? Rest and quiet is what he needs, and I'll look in on him every little while. Rocky could stay, Menelie said, the little bronze fire lizard put in an immediate appearance, chittering worriedly to find himself in such an unexpected place. I won't deny that would be sensible, said Sylvina, glancing at the closed door. Yes, that would be very wise, I think. Everyone watched as Menelie, stroking Rocky gently, told him that he should stay with Pimer and let her know when he spoke. Then she opened the door, just enough to admit the little fire lizard, watched as Rocky settled himself quickly by Pimer's feet, his glistening eyes on the boy's pale face. Rukoyas, would you help Menelie collect Pimer's things from the drum heights? asked the harper. His voice was mild, his manner unexceptional, but unmistakably his attitude informed Durzen that he had misjudged Pimer's standing in the eyes of the most important people of the hall. Durzen offered to do the small task himself and was denied, offered to help Menelie, who awarded him a cruel look. He desisted then, but but the set look on to his mouth and the controlled anger in his eyes suggested that he was going to deal sternly with the apprentices who had put in such an invidious position. When he was unexpectedly placed on duty for the entire feast day, he knew why the roster had been changed. He also knew better than to blame Pimer. Once Menely and the journeyman had left them, Robinson turned again to Sylvina, showing all the anxiety and concern he had kept hidden. Now don't worry, Robinson, Sylvina said, patting him on the arm. He's had a frightful knock on his skull, but I could feel no crack. Those scrapes those scrapes on chin and cheek will mend. He'll be stiff and sore from the bruising, that's certain. If you'd only ask me, if you'd only ask me, and Sylvina man, Sylvina's manner indicated that she'd have her say any road, I'd have said there were much better uses for Pimer than message drumming. He's been a changed lad since he went to the Heights. Not a peep of complaint out of him, but it's as if he won't speak for fear of saying something that was the least bit out of line. And then Durzen has the nerve to say that Pimer babbled drum messages. They were at the Harper's quarters now, and Sylvina waited until they were within before she had her final words. And don't I know what he'd never whispered. And what would that be? Robinson eyed her with weary, with wry amusement. That he brought the master's stones down from the mine, and something else happened that day to keep him overnight, which I haven't discovered yet, she added with a sigh of regret as she seated herself. Robinson laughed then, rubbing his fingers gently on his cheek before he came round the table and poured wine, looking at her as he suspended the wineskin above a second glass. She nodded agreement. She needed the wine after the excitement and worry over Pimer, and with the little bronze watching the boy, she didn't need to hurry back. The whole accident is my fault, said the harper after a long sip of wine. He seated himself heavily. Pimer is clever, and he can keep his tongue still. Too still for his own good, I see now. He hasn't hinted of any trouble in the drum heights to either Menelie or Siebel. They'd be the last he'd tell, except for you. For yourself, of course, Sylvina gave a snort. I only knew about it after the impression at Benden. The others, and Sylvina wrinkled her nose in remembered distaste, treated his new clothes. I came upon him washing them, or I'd never have known either. She chuckled with such malice the harper had no trouble following her thought. They did they did it while he was in at Eigenhold, not knowing about the impression. He joined in her laughter, and Sylvina knew that she'd res resorted or restored his perspective on the unfortunate affair, and to think that I placed him in the drum heights to safeguard him. You're sure he sustained no lasting hurt? As sure as I can be without Master Aldive to confirm it, Sylvina spoke tartly, for Master Aldive's attendance on that worthless Lord of Nabal, when he was urgently needed in the hall, aggravated her intensely. Yes, Marin, the Master Harper sighed again, one corner of his expressive mouth twitching with irritation and an inner perplexity. The man's dying. Not all of Master Aldive's skill can save him, and why bother with Marin? He's better dead after all the harm he's done, when I think that Breck's queen might still be alive today. It's his dying that will cause even more trouble, Sylvina. 
How? We can no more have Neville hold in contention than we can Rotha hold. But Neville has half a dozen heirs of full blood. Marin won't name his successor. Oh, Sylvina's exclamation of startled comprehension was followed quickly by a second of utter disgust. What more could you expect of that man? But surely steps can be taken. I doubt that Master Aldive would scruple against... Master Robinson held up his hand. Neville has been cursed with holders either too ambitious, too selfish, or too incompetent to render it in any way prosperous. To be sure, it's not the best of holds, stuck in the mountains, cold, damp, harsh. Quite right, so there is little sense in forcing combat on the full-blooded heirs when one might just end up with another unsys unsympathetic and uncooperative lord. Sylvina narrowed her eyes in thought. I make it nine or ten full-blooded close male heirs. Those daughters of Marin's are too young to be married, and none of them will ever be pr pretty, taking after their sire as they all seem to have had the misfortune to do. Which of those nine, ten, which would get the most support from the small holders and craft halls? And how, pray tell, does Pimer fit into, uh, but of course. A smile smoothed Sylvina's frown, and she raised her glass to toast the Harper's ingenuity. He did well then at Eigenhold. Indeed he did, though Eigen's a loyal group under any circumstances. Sylvina caught his slight emphasis on the word loyal and scrutinized his thoughtful face. Why loyal, and to whom? Surely there is no more disloyalty to Benden. Robinson gave a quick negative shake of his head. Several disquieting rumors have come to my notice, the most worrying the fact that Nabal abounds with fire lizards. Nabal has no shoreline and scarcely any friends it holds that do acquire that fire lizards are found. Robinson agreed. They have also been ordering and paying for large quantities of fine cloth, wines, and delicacies of Narat, Tilek, and Kirun, not to mention every sort of mongery from the Smithcraft Hall that can be bought or bartered, quantities and quality or quantities and qualities enough to garb, feed, and supply ample every holder caught and hold in Nabal. And don't the old timers. Sylvina emphasized that guess with a snap of her fingers. To call and Moran were always two cuts from the same rib. What I cannot figure out is what besides fire lizards the association gains Marin. You can't, Sylvina was frankly skeptical, spite, malice, scoring off Benden? Robinson reflected on that option, or opinion, turning his wine glass idly, idly by the stem. I'd like to know. Yes, you would. Sylvina grinned at him, tolerance for his fo foibles, I love that word, as well as affection in her glance. You and Pimer are paired in that respect. He has the same insatiable urge to know, and he's a dab hand at finding out, too. Is that why you want his head mended? You're sending him up to Candler at Nabal Hold? No, and the Harper drawled the word, pulling his lower lip. No, not directly to Nabal Hold. Marin might recognize him. The man's never been a fool, just perverted in principle. Just? Sylvina was disgusted. I'd like to know what's going on there. Today is not likely to be the last time Marin summons Master Oldive, she said, raising her eyebrows suggestively. Robinson brushed aside the notion. I hear that a gather has been scheduled at Nibol on the same seven day as Lord Grows. It's that just... It's that just like Marin... Oh, isn't that? I'm sorry. Isn't that just like Marin? Consequently, no one would expect Hall, Hall Harpers to be in attendance. And Robinson ended his sentence on an upswing of tone, eyeing Sylvina hopefully. The boy will be fit enough for a gather, and undoubtedly it's kinder to send him away from the hall on that particular day. Tilgins come along amazingly. Could he do aught else? asked Robinson with real humor in his voice, with both Shonagar and Domic spending every waking moment with him. And that is the end of chapter five. We will read chapter six tomorrow. And I think that's that. And we will say goodnight.